think before I start, I'd just like to um, wish Luisa a happy birthday. <laughs> it's his birthday today. So everyone give him a round of applause. <laughs> I, I don't think um, I can do justice uh, running this session if I don't spend a little bit of time just giving an outline of the fishing industry and what exactly we're talking about here. Um, otherwise, it will look like Greek to most of you. So I think the first thing that we need to understand is if we've got, when we're talking about fishing, it's not quite the same as chicken, where all chickens are the same. Um, they're very different. Um, <laughs> At the one end, you have artisanal fisheries. These are community-based uh, fishermen that will go fishing, catch fresh fish, um, and very little value add, and try and sell it um, wherever. And it's probably the line fish or the fish that you get at the harbors when you go and you see it, or in a restaurant. So very little value add and community-based. And I think Dr. Boerter will know a lot more around uh, artisanal fisheries or small-scale fisheries compared to what I would know. We then have what we term the SMME type fisheries, um, which are your squid and your West Coast rock lobster. And the reason why I put them under SMMEs and not necessarily as small-scale is that there is a level of beneficiation here and a lot of the, most of the product is also exported to, to other markets around the world. And at the other end, you have industrial fisheries. Um, these are very big companies that compete globally against other fisheries, such as New Zealand, the United States, Russia. They're probably all vertically integrated businesses, and it's really the supply chains from fishing to markets that compete. Um, what I'll be doing, and focusing really on the industrial side, because it's 80% of the value created um, in, the, in, in the industry. So I'm really going to focus on that side in terms of the discussions that follow to show you the value chain related to fishing. So I've broken down fishing into three areas really. And if you can't see the screen, don't worry, I'll talk about it. Um, at the one end is what we call fishing. These are vessels uh, with crew and skippers and engineers that will go fishing. Um, they'll bring in the catch. They will either be what we call fresh fish trawlers that will go five to six days of fishing and they'll bring in fish to be processed in a factory. Or you will have what we call freezer type vessels. It's a factory on a ship. It goes out for 45 days and will bring back the final product ready to be uh, packaged. Um, you would employ generally 20 people per thousand tons of quota that you have. Um, so on average, a vessel would have around 65 people going to sea. At the same time, in a processing facility, it creates three times the jobs that you have in fishing. So there we would have 60 people per thousand tons of, uh, of fish that processes. For example, our factory that would be based in Saldana Bay, we would have 1,000 uh, people working in that factory producing, let's say, 20,000 tons of fish. And most of the value add is then in processing facilities, which are then moving on to market. So in this particular fishery, and this one is a Hake deep sea trawling uh, or the Hake fishery, as we know it, it's about 5 billion rand in sales. Most of it is exported, around 65% of it would be exported. Um, and it services markets all over the world. So you would be servicing a big retailer like Lidl and Aldi in Germany, but you could also be servicing somebody in Australia and somebody in the UK like Tesco and Waitrose. So high level of beneficiation, maximum creation of jobs in South Africa, and vertically integrated companies competing against the likes of a Sanford in New Zealand or a Sea Lord in New Zealand or a Trident in the United States of America. I then want to go on and say, because I, I guess the topic today is that around policy certainty, um, and, and really aligning it to the president's, really what he's urging and what he's trying to, to, to get right is, you know, how do we create more jobs? How do we get businesses to invest more? And how do we get growth in this economy? So I've looked at it from that particular aspect and, and saying that in our industry, what does policy certainty bring? And then what does policy certainty cause, uncertainty cause? 
So the first thing is that if you've got policy certainty in our industry, you will invest. Um, you have huge assets that you have to renew. Vessels cost in the region of 250 million rand each. If you know that you've got policy certainty and you've got your rights for a period of time, you will invest. If, for example, in Australia where we operate, uh, policy certainty is such that fishing rights are actually property rights. So you can go to a bank and you can say to a bank, I need to borrow against these rights to be able to invest in a vessel and the, and the bank will give you money. That's what policy certainty brings. It, it allows you to invest in your plants, invest in, in your vessels and really renew your assets and employ more people. The second one is that you're going to increase beneficiation. By investing in vessels and investing in better technology and better factories, you will be able to penetrate new markets in the export market. And that, what, what that means is that you're creating the maximum value in South Africa. In fishing, it's quite different to what you have in, let's say, the diamond industry or the gold industry, where you have beneficiation happening offshore. Here, most 98% of the value is, is actually added in South Africa. So you'll have more of that and you'll have more job creation. What people also don't realize is that although it's quite a consolidated industry, most of the services provided to the big fishing companies are SMMEs, both downstream or upstream, whether it be food provisions for vessels, whether it be engineering services, whether it be laundry for, for their factories, whatever it might be. They, to give you an example, just us as a company on the West Coast, we have 365 SMMEs providing services to our company, all on the West Coast, which is semi-urban. Um, so critical in terms of a multiplier effect um, with policy certainty. So w what is the ultimate what, what is the ultimate result with when we have policy certainty? Well, we have profitable companies that are making money, employing people, paying taxes, bringing in forex, and generally having a sustainable business model. That, that's exactly the picture that we've had in the last 10 years. However, when we go through policy uncertainty, which is really where we are right now, leading up to our rights reallocation, you have no investment. Everybody is paralyzed. Nobody's going to go and spend 250 million rand on vessels or 200 million rand on factories when in two years you don't know what your situation will be. Will, will you have your rights? Will you not? Um, if you lose 10%, you know that you're going to probably lose 30% of your profits. What do you do? So that's where the industry is right now. There's no new markets. There's no higher levels of profitability. It's really cruise control if you're on an airplane. It, nothing really much happens. So the other danger is that it leads to any form of fragmentation leads, and fragmentation I mean new entrants, giving it to, uh, to, to people that have never been in the industry, leads to a commoditization of the industry. In other words, no value creation. It will be landed, it will be sold fresh in the local market, very little level of uh, beneficiation, in fact causing job destruction. And it has a cascading effect, particularly in the smaller towns, um, like St. Helena Bay, Lamberts Bay, Saldana Bay, where generally all those SMMEs are reliant on viable fishing companies to be able to provide their services. So we have a situation right now in Saldana Bay, for example, where Saldana Steel is closing down, and everybody's looking and worrying about the 800 jobs that are going to be uh, lost. It's not the 800 jobs that are the problem. It's the multiplier effect of maybe three, four times um, to Saldana Steel and what happens in the town. Now, I can tell you that, for example, in our company in Saldana, we employ two and a half times that number. So we employ 2,500 people and 4,500 people indirectly. So the effect on small towns is massive. If, if organizations such as um, ourselves suffer. So policy uncertainty and fragmentation, in our view, will, will, will lead to jobs, job disruption. It will lead to no competitiveness globally because you will not have the economies of scale to be able to compete against the likes of the Russians and the Americans. They will be stranded as assets, and at the same time, the resource, which is the most important reason why we are there and making money, which is the fish, that too comes under pressure because fragmented means difficult to police, difficult for compliance, etc., etc. So that's really painting the picture 
from an industry perspective, and I must just qualify that, it's an industry perspective, um, in, ter in terms of what we see policy uncertainty yielding. Um, and these are the discussions we are trying to have with government um, in terms of making sure that we can, at, at the forefront, provide more jobs, invest and grow the economy. So what I'd like to leave the panelists with right now is to say one thing. We are here today because you know, there was a lot of talk in terms of implementing the National Development Plan. Now, the National Development Plan in fishing is actually in industrial fishing, and I'm not talking about artisanal fishing, is actually quite clear. Um, it, it, it says that this industry probably lends itself to further consolidation, not fragmentation. It needs viable quotas for people that want to invest in the industry. Um, and, and you need fewer players to have sustainable management of the marine resources. It, it's actually quite clear. So my question now leading on to the panel is that how then do we ensure that policy certainty promotes growth in the fishing industry while balancing the needs of the country and taking into consideration the economic principles underpinning industrial fishing? Because you, you can't do both. You can try, but it's very difficult to do both. Um, and with that, perhaps I will hand over to maybe pose a question to, to Fatima, um, who their company is a very reputable company in terms of, um, of providing socioeconomic studies in the industry. Um, and you've done quite a bit of work in the industry. And, and maybe to ask you, what, what were the findings that, that you had in the industry? And what stood out for you? with uh, quite a lot of uh, socio-economic studies that you did for the industry. So maybe to just um, you know, hand over to Fatima to, to, to take us from there. Thanks, Felix. Good afternoon, everyone. So as Felix explained, Genesis, we're a consulting firm of economists, and we did a study in two industrial scale um, fisheries, so small pelagics as well as hake, hake deep, deep sea trawling. And I suppose why we think this is important is, in our view, any rights allocation should have regard to the economic characteristics of the fishery. And what we see is that even with these two large scale industrial fisheries, there is definitely different features that would inform how we think about rights allocation going, going forward. I will speak to some of those, but also the second point really is if you want to understand where value add lies, if you want to understand where you see job creation, you really have to look at the full supply chain, and that's some a point you, you really refer to. So it's not just harvesting, which is directly impacted by the rights allocation, but it is further down the process chain of processing and then the marketing. And as you've mentioned, in both the small pelagics and Hake, a large proportion will be exported. And in that case, you are competing against other large scale um, competitors who, who also export. And so for me, you know, thinking about the economic impact that a rights allocation might have, it's critical that you look throughout the full, full value chain. And that's perhaps was a, a big point for me that that stood out. And linked to that, really, where you see most jobs lying. And you know, just taking Hake as an example, it's both at harvesting and processing. And in fact, processing is far more labor intensive than we, that we see. And so if you want to think about value creation, if you want to think about investment and jobs, you have to think about the full value chain. I think that was a, a, a point that stood out. The second point really on the difference. And so both of these are industrial scale fisheries. So there will be some common features. But if I just look at Hake as an example, what is clear is that both at the harvesting and the processing side, these are highly capital intensive industries. You know, the example of a, a vessel, a secondhand vessel costing 
120 million rand. That's if it's fresh, uh, that's a freezer vessel. If you're going to have processing, it can be double that. Those, those are huge numbers. And I suppose the point there is that if you want those investments and those assets to be, to be profitable and sustainable, you have to have high utilization. That's a function of the huge capital costs as well as the high fixed costs. So what you really want, if you want to drive down prices, it's quite obvious that you need to be putting through large volumes of, of fish through those, through those assets. If we look at pelagics, small pelagics, and by that we really mean anchovies and pilchards, what we see is a bit of a different story. So on the harvesting side, whilst it is also capital intensive, it is not as capital intensive as hake. So there you might see more entrants coming in at the harvesting side because the economic features are more conducive to that. But then what we see on the processing side is that this is highly capital intensive and you only have a few canneries and fish meal plants that are able to, to invest. So if you want a entrant or a existing player to integrate into processing, you must understand that it's a large scale game and that you will need capital and you will need, um, and you will need sufficient quota to make it viable. And in those industries, they also have their own fishing um, attributes that are peculiar, so a very volatile um, stock. And so if you have a huge decrease in your stock, that will have a large impact in your ability to, to put product through. But also in some of those industries, importing is possible. And so maybe just to sum up on those two points, really each sector is different and needs to be understood like that. And with each sector, I think it's critical to understand the economic features, not just at harvesting, but along each and every level so that when you do make policy considerations, these can be informed by the economic considerations so that you can understand the impact of the decisions made. Thanks, Fatima. I think that, that those are very good points. And uh, I think one of the reasons that the industry, um, even though it, it prolongs um, uncertainty and volatility, one of the reasons why the industry supported um, the delay in, in the process was because the minister, the, the new minister, um, wanted to do these socioeconomic studies and understand the, the fisheries before putting policy in place. Because each one of them is quite unique and very different. Um, and I totally concur uh, with, uh, with what you have been saying. The other thing, um, because as I've said there, we need to balance the needs of the country. What, was, what did your analysis show around transformation in this particular industry? Because that is also important in terms of government objectives, in terms of making sure we have inclusive growth and not have more of the past. I mean, that is a key consideration. And if you look at the rights policy now, which you know, we understand will be redrafted and reconsidered, you know, there are critical things to think about. It is the socioeconomic features, but also ensuring that there's transformation as a, a critical element. And also, depending on the nature of the fishery, understanding where SMEs can, can, can play a role. So we did look at this because I think it's very important when you think about rights allocation going forward to at least understand what has happened in the past and where we, we sit right now. And so we took a, a view that looked at the historic increase in, in rights allocation. So if we just take Hake as an example, you know, what was clear is in the initial quota board period, there was a huge imperative to, to promote entry. And over that period, which was really a decade between 1991 and 2001, what we observed is there were 40 few, 45 new rights holders added to, I think, what was then an existing 17 rights holders. 
And what we saw there is that most of the entrants that were added were firms owned by historically disadvantaged persons. And so at that stage, what you start seeing is the transformation objectives starting to, to come into, into play by bringing in entrants so that it's not just the previous holders who are active and participating, but then to ensure that those entrants are black owned and um, are able to participate. What we observe in the periods after that, almost the mid-term and the long-term FRAP, which happened in 2005, that there seemed to then be an imperative to, to rather consolidate the existing rights holders. So what we did not see was a increase like we saw in that previous period. And there the imperative then was to ensure transformation within the industry. So for those who had rights to make sure that they would at least be transforming themselves so that the industry as a whole becomes transformed. And they did that really through two things. You know, first by ensuring that transformation and on a broad level, not just black ownership, is incorporated in an allocation process so that if you want rights, you must understand that you need to be a transformed firm and that is in line with the objectives of, um, of the general policy. But also by making it a competing process. So it wasn't just about having a level and if you meet it, you get an allocation. It was about making it relative. So your allocation depended not on a threshold, but also on, on being more transformed than others. And so what we observe is as a result of, of that, that transformation over time has improved um, quite significantly. So black ownership went from 30% to around 60. And what we found is that the top three firms are level one BEE contributors. And if you compare it to other sectors, um, it, it ranks well. So I think it's important point, Felix, is to understand what has happened, because that should inform how we think about ensuring this continues going forward in a way that, that works for the industry. Thanks, Fatima. Thank you very much for that. I'm going to turn my, on the other side here, and I'm going to pick on the birthday boy. Um, Loiso, you represent um, members in your association, which are very diverse. Um, what would you say are the key challenges facing your members um, where, you know, particularly with the regulator. Um, I think maybe, you know, hand over to you. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I think just, just as a way of background, so Fisher say represents 12 associations uh, that on their own represent different species within the fishing. They are all in the commercial space, SMME and also industrial. So it's basically 89% 80, 80, of the entire sector basically form as part of our members. And then within those associations are obviously individual companies who are in the process of applying for rights are going to be applicants and therefore affected by, um, you know, FRAP policy and other policies which uh, impact on the, on the process. I think the main concern, as you've also highlighted, is that uh, for both the SMMEs and also the industrial players who are bigger, they obviously want to know what's going to happen because the message uh, perhaps hasn't been very clear and there has been uh, you know, a, bit of, a bit of worry in the sector as to what's going to take place. And uh, there is a view now that the minister has, has stopped the process and, and restarting that we are going to be engaged so that some of the things that Fatima raises and some of the things that you, you also raise make it to the, you know, uh, to the right ears in terms of the policy development that must take into account the socioeconomic issues, that must take into account you know, the preservation of jobs, that must take into account you know, the issues of transformation. And within that context, Obviously, as you put it, no one would invest now in, in, in the sector because, well, they don't know. While that may not necessarily be a negative thing from us at this stage, but I think going forward, what the message is going into FREP 2020 or FREP 2021 is that we need, we need to be engaged as a, as a fishing sector. And that is so because we contribute significantly 
uh, you know, in terms of terms of jobs. I think one of the things you didn't mention is that the entire sector contributes plus at, in, directly in excess of 27,000 jobs. And those are direct jobs. And if you look at uh, indirect jobs, also, also uh, depending on the fishing sector, we're looking at plus minus 87,000. And that's a, a huge, a huge number. I mean, the Deputy States General here mentioned an issue about, uh, uh, about the main driver, uh, basically, of poverty. And he said the main driver of poverty is unemployment. Now, if you've got a sector that contributes 27,000 direct jobs and, and in excess of about 87,000 indirect jobs in total, that's, that's significant. And you want to ensure that your policy ties up into that. Now, you, you can't do that if you don't take into account some of the things that uh, Fatima mentions, for example. Uh, we have had before uh, a lot of accusations, especially from, from, from players who are not in the commercial space, who would say, for example, oh no, there's a monopoly in the industry. Now, it's all nice and good uh, to you know, put out these logins without looking into the data, for example, without looking into the socioeconomic impact and the jobs. Uh, that, the, that the industry provides. Now, if you want to maintain these 87,000 plus jobs, if you want to ensure that there's more jobs uh, that, are, that are basically created within the sector, and you want to make sure that the players that are already there, including uh, uh, yourselves, are able to invest, you want to ensure that the policy is certain so that everybody is aware what is going to happen. Now, if you can't do that, at least involve the industry in the policy making so that we become active, so that we become players in the job creation, instead of saying, we will be outside and make policy for you, and you will sit outside and, and we will tell you what we have done. And I think the sector wants to play that role. It wants to play that role because, as I say, it wants to keep the jobs it has created. It wants to increase the jobs it has created. It wants to increase the investment. That, those cannot be negative elements at all, by any chance. Now, that is not to say, oh no, you are anti-transformation, because I'll tell you, in the SMME sector, for example, within Fish SA, uh, which, which consists of plus minus 75% uh, of, our, of our members, I, I, believe, I believe over 75% of that SMME sector is all black-owned uh, black companies. Now, you can't, you can't say then, no, if you, if you say we must consolidate in the industry, you are basically preventing transformation. But you've got to interpret transformation correctly, because those members are transformed. The industrial players, it's easy to get a data for data for them, especially the listed entities. They too uh, score beautifully, as 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 as, as Fatima has indicated. But I think the imperative should be saying then we need to balance it. The ones that are already inside, basically, you don't want them to lose out. There are uh, uh, significant black players that have come into the fishing space. We want to ensure that those players, you know, continue in the sector, continue to create jobs instead of fragmenting by introducing new people who haven't been in that space and, and therefore obviously creating now a situation where the industry becomes a free for all and then it's not, and it doesn't create the kind of jobs that we want to create, it doesn't drive the kind of investment that we want to drive. So in a nutshell, we want to influence the policy because it's important we do so, because we want to drive the, the preservation, the creation of jobs and also we want, we want to encourage our members both in the SMME space and in the industrial space to continue investing. Because through that investment, we can increase the numbers of employment and also increase the numbers of beneficiation in terms of the business cycle itself. So that, that in the main will be the biggest concern for our mem for, from our members. And also wishing that we are going to participate in the process and also wishing that from these different sectors that you've mentioned in terms of the fisheries, the policies are going to look into the specifics to ensure that each one of them is dissected properly in terms of its value, its transformation, and also in terms of how it benefits the communities uh, where, that, where that fishing takes place. So those are some of the things we want because as you indicated, you know, we're not like the chicken industry. We have differences and we want government to say, we take policy into account, and rather we take research, you know, and the social economic impact into account, but we are not going to have a, a one size fits all. We are going to look seriously into it for the main reason that we want to keep the sector viable. It is important, I want to repeat some of the beautiful things that you've mentioned in terms of bringing Forex and the employment, but if we want to continue having a thriving industry, we need government to commit to that. Of course, fish is a depletable resource. Of course, it's heavily regulated. There are issues of sustainability. 
all these elements tie in in, in the policy development and the policy making. And that's why we need industry participation. We need capacity building within, within the department also to work with us in terms of ensuring that the resource is sustainable because only we can have a thriving fishing industry if the resources are also sustainable. But we can't be spectators in the process. We've got to be part and parcel of the drive to create what the NTP wants to see to create what the Deputy State General talked about, which is to fight poverty, you've got to ensure that you create employment. Thank you, Loiso. Thank you for that. Now we'll go to the, the man on the other side, um, you know, with, uh, that, that has done so much work in small scale. Dr. Berta, I think the, 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 the question from, from most people in industry usually is that, in our view, um, Small-scale fisheries and, uh, and, and industrial fisheries seldom overlap, um, in, our, in our opinion, and you can touch on that. But there's a lot of noise um, that's in the press, that all the big companies are taking all the fish away, and, uh, and, and the small fishermen and the communities are, are, are being depleted, and the resources are being depleted. And you, you see it all the time in the news. In fact, I think... The, the minister, in fairness, is spending probably 80% of her time dealing with issues related to small scale, um, we, which we've shown is probably maybe 5-7% of the GDP within the sector. So why this um, big divide between small scale and large industrial fishery? Can you, can you maybe, as an expert in the field at uh, UWC for so many years, touch on it? Okay, um, I'll, I'll try. Um, for me, it's the, the divide between small scale and, and industrial fisheries to me is kind of artificial. Um, small scale fisheries are, are normally operate close to the shoreline, so they would operate within one nautical mile or five nautical mile from, from, from the shoreline. Whereas your industrialized fisheries, you guys operate on the high seas. So, so the, the, the divide that's there is often artificial divide. Now, now, who created the divide? I don't want to go into that particular thing now. But I, but I do want to say that policy certainty, and if I can come back to, to the whole question around policy certainty, policy certainty has a huge impact on the small scale as much as it has an impact on industrial fisheries. Small scale fishers also wants to know at this point in time, what is in the basket of species? What are we getting as small scale fishers? Um, and small scale fishers um, want to also grow and develop their businesses and, and they can't access finance because um, they don't know what is, what is in, in their basket. So the whole policy uncertainty, as much as it affects industrialized fisheries, is also affecting the small scale fisheries. And I mean, if, if I can put it in, into context, while, while I was doing my research and I looked at what is the net earnings of a small scale fisher throughout the coasts. Um, and then I came to the realization that a, a small, the net earnings of a small scale fisher, the annual net earnings, are, is actually less than, than, than a state welfare grant. So, which is frightening. I mean, they're earning less than 18,000 rand a year, their net earnings. And then I ask myself, how do you survive? So, the whole question of policy certainty is how do we grow, how do we grow those, those small scale fishes? Um, and, and how do we unpack that? Um, and for us, it's, yeah, it's, as I mentioned earlier, the, the, whole, the whole question is, is, is artificial. It's not, it's not um, because small scale fishes close to, to the shoreline, off, offshore, offshore sectors there. But, but there are some of the species that actually overlap, and one of it is West Coast rock lobster. We, we have offshore West Coast rock lobster and near shore West Coast rock lobster. And what the ministry or the department did is that they allocated offshore rights to small scale fisheries, which creates other, other dynamics as well. Um, so what, what, what is needed is greater certainty within that particular space. Uh, and then once we have greater certainty in terms of what goes to the small scale, what is part of the small scale species, we can actually, we can also then unpack the, the value chain. Because the value chain is also pertinent to, to the small scale fisheries. Um, as part of my research, um, I came to, to realize that only 38% of the, of the value within the small scale fisheries, value, uh, West Coast, West Coast rock, rock lobster value chain actually accrues to the small scale fishes. So it's a, so it's a finite. So they need to, to also um, start to consolidate as small scale fishes uh, to, 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 ex, to, to start uh, exporting, to, to process and export the fish. So, 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 so that, that policy certainty is as important to them as, as for the big players. Um, something that, that I played with and, and, um, as part of, of my research was to say, 
we want to balance it, and I, I like what you're saying over here, balancing the needs of, of the country, and how can we actually do it? How can we ensure that um, big industry creates jobs, and we, uh, um, but how can we ensure that big industry actually develops small, small scale sex plays as well? And there's a myriad of examples. I mean, in terms of BE school, we, we can actually create the fisheries charter to say, this, this is what we're going to do in terms of the fisheries uh, uh, sector and create a charter to say, we want to develop small scale and SMME fisheries. I mean, and we have a charter and we say, how are we going to achieve it? The other process is to look at, most probably in terms of policy, and this is where policy comes in, is to look at and say, uh, we're starting with FRAP 2021 now, we're starting with the FRAP process. Um, can't we build in the FRAP process to say, um, incentives when to, 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 to your, your, your bigger place, to, to your um, industrial place, say, let's create incentives for them to assist small scale and to assist, assist SMMEs. Because if we do that, we can actually, we can, we can, we can build entrepreneurship activities within that particular sector. We can actually create more jobs. Um, but we need to create, it's, it, and, and I don't see the two as being um, opposing forces. I actually see them as working together. But it's how do we create that unity? Mm. Um, and I think the uh, big big industry wants to assist, and small industry wants big industry to assist. And then the as part of, of that policy, and, and um, we could also be looking at um, in terms of when we speak about about the value chain, um, uh, getting maximum price for the fish, getting maximum price for West Coast rock lobster, maximum price for your um, a line fish species, and uh, big industry is already operating. They understand the markets. Uh, it's about engaging in a five to ten year horizon in terms of mentoring and coaching programs to assist smaller players, to assist communities to develop and to look at, at alternative livelihoods as well. So I think that is what, 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 the, what the policies should actually speak about. And we need greater policy certainty to address um, the needs of the country. Because with, with that, um, big industry will say, okay, fine, if I actually invest more in small scale, I'll be incentivized to do that. So I will invest more, and um, I think I think that's from, from 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 my side, I think that that's going to be critical. Thanks. Uh, I, I think before I open it up to the floor, uh, ju just thank you all of, to the speakers. But just to give some examples globally, we're not unique. Um, so we're not the only ones in the world facing these type of issues. Um, if you look at the Russian fishery, which has got the biggest fishing resources in the world, was completely fragmented. So it doesn't strike me as a surprise that when the, 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 the people doing the research for the National Development Plan looked probably at other fisheries around the world and said the only way to have profitable, globally competitive fisheries is consolidation. Um, and Putin actually has those incentives in place to say that I will give you quotas, but I need you to invest, I need you to build factories, I need you to help small scale guys, um, I need consumption to remain in Russia. So the reality is there are models available in terms of, of, of ensuring getting the ultimate final game. But however, I can say that fisheries that have fragmented have had issues with resource management, they've had issues everywhere. And, and that is just the reality. The world, all the models show us that. And you're right. I, I think whether you're small scale or you're industrial, the same principles apply. You want to create jobs, you want to add value, and you want to get the maximum price back to the boat, which is the fisherman. So opening up to, to some questions from the floor um, for, for the three people here, because I've only been asking the questions. So I'm going to take a seat now. And uh, hopefully there are some good questions that put them under a bit of uh, difficulties from the floor. I know it sounds like fish, but it's, it's you know, think chicken if you have to. <laughs> well, uh, there's one, that, one over there. I never ask them the hard questions. <laughs> Good day. Uh, my name is Raymond Kasinganeti. I'm the head of SMME development at uh, Siaka Consulting. We are very passionate about, uh, you know, developing small um, companies. <laughs> so while you were uh, presenting, you mentioned that Sea Harvest, I think, if I'm not mistaken, you said that you support about 265 
small to medium enterprises, they are your suppliers, am I correct? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So what I wanted to find out is that, and that is also for the panel, within that industry, the, the fisheries industry, um, what, what initiatives are there, what programs are there to create sustainable uh, sustainability within these companies that you are working with? Because what often happens is that as soon as you move maybe to another area or to a different country or a different province, uh, for example, those guys, those small companies collapse because there was no sustainability built into it. So you find that it was more of sort of grant or charity type of thing. Whereas we are looking for ways to make those businesses sustainable so that they can outlive their, their, their buyers. So what are the initiatives, what are the programs, what are the mechanisms in place to make sure that there's sustainability for these uh, SMMEs within the fisheries industry? Thank you. I'll, I'll take that first one. Um, it's a very good question. Um, the reality is that I don't think we will have a growing economy unless we have SMMEs that are growing and are sustainable. That is the reality because it creates a significant amount of jobs. Um, in our case, our example has been that it's very, very difficult for an SMME to get funding. That, that is the biggest barrier um, that we've seen. And the only way that that has worked is for the companies, the bigger companies initially, to back SMME development and, and really be the funders of those SMMEs initially. Um, and it's not only funding, it's also skills, because that's what we've seen lack. So, for example, we have got our people to go and train them, and it's actually more time investment than it is only that. So we have managed over time, and it's been a long period, it's been probably a period of 20 years, um, to effectively make sure that most of our suppliers in the West Coast area are black suppliers, and most of them are SMMEs. So it's more than 265, it's actually 365. Um, and it's the bulk of our suppliers today, other than fuel, which we don't have a choice, um, and, and packaging. The rest of it, we have had a focused campaign in terms of making sure we develop those MMEs because it's good for the town, it's good for jobs, there are no social issues, etc., etc. The reality to answer your question, they will not be sustainable without us there, unfortunately, because you need the big player there where the fish is. So I, I don't believe um, the big companies will get up and leave those towns because that's where the fish is. It makes economic sense to be set up there, and that's why they were set up there. But if there is reallocation, and you have smaller operators working out of Cape Town, because it's not going to be in these small little ports, um, you will have a complete destruction of those SMEs. I actually don't know how to answer you of how to make them more sustainable. The only other way is for the IDZ to go away ahead like in Saldana Bay and have a lot more companies of our size there that are able then to give work to those SMEs to be able to sustain them should, a, should we have a wobbly. But the reality is that we don't need to have a wobbly because if, if, if I think we do the right things in terms of... Um, uh, uh, government and policies, I don't think that will happen. Uh, you know, if I look back at our company uh, when I joined, it was owned predominantly white owned by Tiger Brands um, and one company g getting everything. Today, because of the way policies are in the sector, we're 83% black owned. Most of our suppliers are small black suppliers. Um, we've had a conscious 70% of our management. Um, comes from previously disadvantaged communities, which let me tell you, sometimes it's quite tough to get people to go work in Saldana Bay in these small towns. It's not that easy and to get skills. But if you have a focused effort because you know that's the reason why you survive, you do it. Um, so we've been successful in that and I think most of the other fishing companies have been too. I also would like to stress that even what we've noticed, even with people that are SMMEs within the sector Loyiso, if they don't have a big brother, because the banks are not your, your friend in the, in the sector, there's too much risk and uncertainty. If they don't have a big brother, and what I mean is that we're dealing with the sea. The sea is dangerous. When you have a, a, a breakdown at sea, and you have, you've got nothing, you're, you're, you're a, 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 a dead vessel, you need partners to tow you, to help you rebuild your vessel, to catch your fish. It, 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 the industry lends itself to helping each other. 
um, because of, of the vagaries of the sea. So hopefully I've answered that question because I think it's a very important question in terms of SMME development. I don't know if you want to add something, anybody else? Yeah, I think, I think also without uh, praising fish for swimming, and uh, you can excuse the pun, uh, most of our members, the, the industrial players, have actually come on board as far as trying to assist the SMMEs, whether within the fishing space or the SMMEs that are supplying with other with other indirect um, uh, 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 services to the to the industry. But then again, if you want to sustain it, I think for us we'll always go back to the policy. As long as you as long as you have your SMME sector and your industrial players, you know, with a, with a certain, with a policy that is certain, with a policy that encourages their growth, then the SMMEs have no reason to worry. And I think the, at the at the level where we are at at Fisher says to try and lobby for these policies, but also show that in fact with these policies you are able to have a thriving SMME sector as well with within fishing and also the the outside SMME sector. Uh, you know, recently I was in Port Elizabeth and I met a young gentleman from Queenstown who was who was, who was supplying engineering services uh, to the squid industry. That's your your calamari in, in, in Port Elizabeth, and he had an opportunity uh, to come into industry, you see. So he's not going to be applying for rights to, uh, to go and fish. What he's doing, but he's getting, he's getting his work from companies who've got rights to go and, 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 and fish squid. And that's how you will build the SMME sector. So what we're saying at Fish SA is that we are an important sector, not just because we get the fish out, process it, and sell it, but we're also important because we affect the economies of the areas where, where these companies are situated. And that is why you need a concerted effort from all the players, and that's why you need us to come and influence the policy and tell government that, look, this is what we have achieved. In the past, there have been also complaints that, you know, despite all the great efforts that uh, bigger companies have made uh, in terms of changing and trying to, and trying to boost the MME sectors, if you don't have any recognition of that in the policies, that's exactly what creates the fragmentation. Because you don't want, you don't, you're not saying to them, look, you, you, I see what you have done, and therefore I'll keep you where you are, or I'll give you more, you know, so that you can continue doing what you're doing, and also going to the very SMMEs, especially the ones in the fishing, and say to them, you know what, you need to be viable, so I'll keep you in, because you're already inside. Then you're going to ultimately destroy the industry. I made one example uh, the, the, the other day in a, in a similar forum, where I said, if you were a CEO of Nike or Adidas, and you wanted to sponsor a young South African uh, to go compete in Olympics to represent South Africa. And then you had, you had two choices to make. You give your new shoes, your new boots to me, or the guy that you always see every morning when you go to work running next to the road. Of course that guy's got a better chance of winning uh, a medal for South Africa or in the Olympics than if you give those running shoes to me, because I'm not there in the morning. So we need to recognize that the people who are already in the sector, who, are, who have already invest, invested, whether they big, whether they fall within the SMME sector, we need to keep them there in order to continue creating and stabilizing the industry. If I can just add to your example of the shoes, you know, that's exactly what we did see in our, in our study, at least that there are some smaller industrialists who have already invested in the, in the sector and who, who are active. And any allocation must think about the, the impact of taking away from, from those who are already small and need the scale to, to entities who have not yet invested. So where there is already industrialists who, who have invested, who are involved, I think there needs to be a, a careful consideration of how they can be supported through that, the rights allocation process. And we're not talking about the big firms, we're thinking about some, some smaller industrialists who are already active and have already shown a willingness to invest, and that matters a lot if you actually want participation. Yeah, I, I think to add to that, 15 years ago when we went through this process, it was quite different, um, because you never had so many black industrialists that invested in, in the businesses. Um, I think it would be a slap in the face for those black industrialists today that put capital, that put time, that put energy, and, you know, 10 years later, lose their rights to new players that have never been there before. Uh, what is the incentive of, of bringing black industrialists back into the sector? So I think South Africa, this industry has changed significantly to at least what I had seen 15 years ago 
when this process was, was started. So that, that, that is a good point. There's a question there. Afternoon. Um, maybe I, I don't have a, a clear understanding of uh, some of the issues that have been discussed. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, however, I, I need to understand something. If, 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 I re if I read well, the spirit of the NDP is to create sustainable businesses so that the communities that uh, the government is looking to pull out of poverty, they can be able to sustain themselves far beyond what uh, big players can do. And based on, on, on the comment, um, without big players, all those small players that are there at the moment, there will be no more. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand at what, at what level should we be looking into this discussion uh, of, of how do we then change the narrative to become that of sustainable far beyond just the current players? How do, they, how do we create access for them, the smaller guys, into the market? How do we develop them such that they are able to go far beyond just supplying the, buy the buyers, but also having access to market so that they can live far beyond the big players and be able to sustain and create the employment that we long for? So uh, again, it's a very good question and something we are asked often. Can I use another analogy, maybe not in fishing, uh, and I'm going to use the airline industry. There are certain industries that do not lend themselves to, to, to let's call it, small, um, to be globally competitive. So if you took an airline like, like British Airways or SAA, who needs economies of scale to be competitive, it needs a fleet of, vessel, of, 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 of airplanes. Um, for that to be profitable, it needs economies of scale, it needs capital, an airplane costs two, three hundred million rand. If you break that up and take those airplanes and give them to 20 people, you're never going to have a profitable airline because one plane will never, you cannot cover the world, you cannot do anything. It's exactly the same thing in industrialized fishing. So the value is not going to come by taking the, the big players, an SAA or a BA, and breaking it down into 20 companies. The value will come in terms of making sure that that particular company is globally competitive, it creates more jobs, and the multiplier effect around it, all the people that are supplying services to British Airways or Safair, that is where, if, if, if you're growing, you're creating the multiplier effect. Granting access in a capital-intensive industry where you need 250 million just to buy one ship and you need a fleet which is going to be 10. So you need 2.5 billion just to come into the game. It's quite difficult. So the, every industry is different. So you have certain industries that lend themselves to smaller players and then you develop them and you, you have a cascading effect in terms of jobs. You have other industries that are so capital intensive, you'll make them not competitive globally and you'll break them up. So that is, that is I think, an answer to quite a difficult question. Um, with another analogy, and the narrative should be, how do we support this? It, it doesn't help anybody when we're having, because who should be granted access? That's the other point. Why is the one person better than the other person when that person's never been involved in the industry? So, so th which is another issue. So the narrative should be exactly what I think you've said, is that how do we support what we have to create more jobs, growth, and investment, and bring more people into the industry, but it might not be at certain areas of the value chain. It might be other areas of the value chain where it makes sense. I hope I've answered it, um, the question. But, uh, I mean, you can also come in. Uh, my, my, my view is basically... A bit louder. Oh, okay. 
my, my view is basically for that to work is that for SMMEs to actually become profitable is for them to, to, um, to, to act as, as collectives. That's the only way it can actually work. Because, I mean, it's, Felix is correct. I mean, you, you, cannot, you, you cannot do it because it's, 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 it's fragmented. But for SMMEs to work together is another challenge. Because the one is always looking over, over, over his, his shoulder and say, isn't the other one doing me in? So, but I mean, that can work, but then, then there needs to be, to be an um, enabling environment for that to happen. And quite often when collective ownerships w work is when there's, there's, there's a third party that actually assists them to achieve that. Now, um, that's the only way it, it can work. But do we have a third party at the moment that can assist the SMMEs? Um, that's, that, but, 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 but that's where, where, where government can actually play a role in terms of policy. Um, I would say, and I would agree, um, you need to, especially in, in, in the industrialized fisheries sector, you need these big players, you need a few, a few big players. But what I would also say, maybe we can have it as a test example to say, okay, we've got how many SMMEs? Maybe in, in not, maybe not, 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 not in Nike, but we've got a number of SMMEs. But can't we look at consolidating them and then from there look at the model to see, okay, we test it over five years, can it work, can't it work? Maybe, um, but, but we don't want, want to change the formula too much either, because if you're going to change the formula, and I would agree with, with, with Felix, then, then that may, that may, may, may lead to, to job losses. But, but maybe we can have it as a test example, and maybe do, do, do a test over five year, 10 year period to see, consolidate the SMMEs. Is uh, bring a third party into a system because obviously there's going to be a lot of infighting, and then uh, see how, how that works. Oh hi, well, uh, seeing that we're all talking about you know giving SME skills and then as well as building them up, the question is: Are we then looking at bridging the gap between the whole you know the? Uh, South African trade, because 95% of the South African trade is, uh, movement is done through the marine uh, uh, transportation. Are we only then looking at fisheries, or are we building the gap in terms of, uh, you know, transportation through the sea? Because there's a big gap in that, and I come from a transformation background. I know very well that a lot of small entrepreneurs are in the transport sector. So uh, definitely another sector where you, you, you need to try and build around it. So if I look at, you know, Saldana Bay and they're trying to have, you know, shipbuilding as a sector, they're trying to have, you know, rather than having all these international players try and localize a lot of the, of, of, of the production. Mm. Um, in, in everything, though, I think the common theme has to be that you need, you need a profitable environment and capital around and jobs to create jobs in anything that you're doing. Um, and, and that, even in that sector, it requires the Mersks of the world, it requires SAF Marines, etc., and then have the cascading effect. I think they, it's not, as, as I think you, you said, in, it's not that there's a, a big issue between big and small. I think it's quite different because it can be very complementary. I think the bigger issue that the smallest players are facing is, is access to capital. Even when they have access to markets, it's access to capital that, and, and skills that becomes the big issue. And there, you need the bigger players who have been there and seen the movie to transfer those skills. And then I agree with what uh, Dr. Berto was saying, because if you look at certain markets like Australia, we're not unique. In Australia, the West Coast, um, Western Australian rock lobster, the industry was making losses for 15 years. It was fragmented. It had 35 fishermen. Everybody going into the market and the Chinese were saying $8 here, $5 here, $3 here, driving the price down. Until they actually formed a co-op and they all sold through one area with one price to the Chinese and effectively after that everybody made money. So the model is correct as well in terms of even a smaller player needs to get bigger to be able to have a say in, in what they're doing. Hi there. I think uh, maybe just to help you guys, uh, Leonard friends, I'm also in the fishing sector. I want to take that up front. In your question about the, the small scale, how do you, or the smaller players, how do you help them to go bigger and also to kind of create the perception that they can only survive if there's a dependency on bigger players. I think it's also key to mention that you guys sitting there are thinking more Hague. 
But in the fishing sector, we've got a different species. We've got hake, we've got hosmogran, we've got uh, squid, we've got lobster, south coast lobster, and all of that. So there are some species that lend themselves to that type of independence. Obviously, provided you've got capital, and provided you've got the knowledge, the know-how of what to do. Like, for instance, in the squid sector in PE, a lot of guys operate there independently. The ones that went there over time, like starting early, and they have got the skill and all of that. Those ones can operate independently. But obviously, if you're operating in a bigger industrialized sector like Hague Deep Sea Troll, as a, where you need vessels, you need factories, and all of that, the nature of the beast is that it's capital intensive, but at the same time, it's also labor intensive. So to actually want to be a small scale there, you can be. It's as simple as that. It's more like saying, I want to be a small scale diamond miner. I cannot be, but I can supply something into the mining sector. And again, the point around politicity in the space is not just politicity, it's also execution as well. Because you can have policies, if they're not executed the way that they've been crafted, it's not a problem for big companies, it's a problem for everybody. I operate in that space, I cannot invest anything purely because in the next year or two, I don't know exactly how to dance so that I remain on the dancing floor. So that's basically what I wanted to, the input I wanted to give, thank you. All right, uh, good afternoon again. Um, my question is to the panel, uh, but particularly to Fatima. Um, so I'm of the view that uh, SMEs will have quite a challenge in terms of um, playing at uh, s almost the same level with sea harvest and other companies due to some economies of scale. Um, they're unable to um, produce in mass um, due to their infrastructure. So my question really is around the technology for SMEs. Is there then an opportunity where they can then compete on a business model basis where um, they will have far better opportunity to build uh, viable businesses for themselves? Um, because I don't think they can really compete in terms of economies of scale um, with bigger players. But in terms of the business model, are there any opportunities for disruption there, uh, particularly the technology around fishing industry for SMEs? Okay, when, we, when we answer that, you can take that. Okay. I mean, that is a, a good question. I think just in terms of technology, I'll leave that to, to Felix in the sense that if it's um, fixed or not, the, the research does show that you know, as it is, is capital intensive. But what we do see is different models emerging to try and deal with that. So you do get the big industrialists who are completely vertically integrated and own their own harvesting vessels, et cetera, through to, to processing. But what you do see is other business models emerging. So for example, the cluster model where you see rights holders joining on a single vessel and, and forming a JV. And in those cases, those are really the f frozen trawlers where they can freeze and then send off to, to the export market in that manner. And so what we see is almost the kind of scale you get does determine how you participate, whether you can be vertically integrated like some of the, the bigger firms, or there are other options that we, we, we observe where smaller rights holders, in a sense, group together to try and consolidate and, and for example, buy a share on a, on a trawler together. And in that way, they, they can compete, but it, using a very different model, but also it doesn't mean that they'll be involved in the value add processing. They're, it would inform a different model. So just to also touch on that, um, I think it also depends on the nature of the industry. And the reason I'm saying that, and, and, and the colleague next to you is right, I'm just going to take the, the deep sea, the industrialized side, because it's, that's the one that I'm involved in. Because it's an export-oriented industry, the competitor is not local. So the gentleman that's next to you that's also in the industry, he's not our competitor. We are competing against New Zealand, against uh, Australia, against... Uh, that, that is the supply chain. The, another South African player in the industry, it's in our interest that that player becomes successful 
throughout the value chain, uh, whatever it takes. It could be forming a joint venture on a vessel or whatever it might be. But the nature of the game, it, and as I say, it's, it's like an SAA competing against an Alitalia. Th that's what we're competing against. So in industrialized fishing, I take the point of, 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 of the gentleman next to you in terms of there are different fisheries because you're right, the, the squid fishery, which is much less labor intensive, lends itself more to SMMEs because a vessel can be purchased for, say, five, six million, and, and you can produce on board and export the product. However, it still doesn't change the fact that it's already a, a, an industry which is already occupied with those SMMEs. It's fully serviced, and those people are profitable and have invested. So to then break that up again to introduce new players, I, it's that policy that I... I so, so what we need to be doing is look at those SMMEs and make sure those companies that are already there are successful. Um, and, and I can tell you, 80% probably of the players in the Eastern Cape are, 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 are black players. They, 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 they're not big companies. So I think that's, that's where policy needs to be informed, and, and I agree with you, in terms of having the facts. You can't do, I think, what you said, Loiso, um, one size fits all, because I think that's what happens with fishing. I think when I started this and I was saying, we're going to talk about fishing, Everybody thinks of fishing. We're all in the same camp, but it's not. When you're comparing squid, which is calamari, to hake, it, it's like comparing chicken to beef, as an example. It's completely different industries, value chains, uh, it, locations, everything is different. So the one-size-fits-all is the problem, and I think we'll have policies that encourage SMME development, some that keep the bigger players competitive globally, Etc. I think that's that that and and I think that's where what we are saying as as an industry is that the regulator we have more dialogue with the regulator, mm. government, mm. to understand whatever policies you you put in place will either create jobs or destroy jobs, mm. and you got to do it fact based, not yeah. just you know people in a closed room, you know writing something and 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 then it has unintended consequences. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sea Harvest.